thank you, Jesus. We just call the prayers to a close and we just release a shift right now across the nation. Father, we thank you that where you are high and lifted up, Lord God, you draw, you draw, you draw all men unto yourself. And Father, we just pray, let's stand. Father, we just ask your Holy Spirit to come in increasing power, to come in increasing power, Lord God, to fall upon each one of us. And Father, we welcome everybody on the screen right now. If you're watching at home, we welcome you. And we ask Holy Spirit to fill you and to fill your home right now, wherever you're watching this, whichever part of the world you're in right now, we just release Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit to come upon you right now. Father, we thank you that we are here for no other purpose than to glorify you. Lord God, we exalt you today in Jesus' name. I just want to welcome you today, wherever you've come from, wherever you're watching from. I just want to honour Jane and Jeff Blees who are here today. Um, good friends of ours who, um, when Stephen and I first became Christians, they did a great job, a great job in discipling us. And it's very apt that they're here today. And we just, I just really want to honour you. And Dave Connolly, who's at the back as well, just great giants of faith. Um, you know, we need to honour God's people, don't we? You know, it's really important. Um, the Bible says, Psalm 67, verse 1, May God be gracious to us. May his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation, your salvation, which is what we're going to be talking about today, among all the nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. You know, I hate going to meetings where we sing about joy and our faces are miserable. You know, so turn to the person and say, you need a joyful face today because we're praising the Lord. <laughs> we do. So I just want to give a big welcome to our, our worship team um, who come together from across the region and across different denominations and churches. And we just say, Holy Spirit, inhabit our praises today in Jesus' name. Amen.
God of Jacob, great I am, King of angels, song of man, voice of many waters, song of heaven's throne, louder than the thunder, make your glory known.
was a good practice you know we've been sharing about how God wants us to use songs prophetically and I want us to sing that again I really believe the Lord wants us to sing that again and I want you to release that roar of the lion of Judah you know listen to the words of the song read the words of the song sing the words of the song prophesy the words of the song every mountain that is opposed to God's kingdom over our nation right now let it be brought low you know every valley at this time of shift and change that needs to be raised up let it be raised up why don't we sing that again you know God will speak to you Lord, I just want to pray for every man and woman here that, Lord God, they will hear prophetically. Lord God, and you'll give them visions as we sing this song, Lord, as we sing it over. Lord, our government, as we sing it, God, over our monarchy. Lord God, as we sing it over the church. Lord God, Lord God, those three specific pillars. Lord God, speak to us so that we can declare. We can declare out from this place today. Lord God, and release the heavenly realms over each of those areas, Lord. In Jesus' name. He raised up all mountains. Be made low, O valley. Be raised up, O mountain. Be made low, O valley. Be raised up, O mountain. Be made low, O valley. Be raised up. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare
prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. We were singing um, the Lord showed me a picture um, and at the beginning it was Jesus you know and everybody was um, laying down the palm branches and, and Jesus was coming in um, and the Lord said to me um, I want you to lay church down and I want you to hear me right I heard the Lord saying, we're going to be talking about the cross and salvation later on. And I was going to try and do it then. God said, no, I want you to do it now. And I heard the Lord say, um, I want you to take up a giant cross. There's like this giant cross. I can see it in this room. It's absolutely enormous. And, you know, we can, God is going to be speaking to us about our own individual crosses later on. But I just sense the Lord wants to do something really, really powerful in his church that he loves. Because he is bringing his church and resurrecting it to be the bride. And I just sense as we join together, if, we can, if you're able to stand and just connect with one another. And I just want you to picture this huge cross in this room right now. And whatever church you're from or whichever church you've been in or whether the church God lays on your heart, we're just putting it on the cross. It's not a negative thing. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. So, Father, we just come, even if we can join hands. I know it's a covid time, but you know what? God will, I'm sure God will look after us. Thank you, Lord. Lord God, we just come, wow, on behalf of your church, Lord God, across this region and across the nation. And we lift the church and we lift it onto the cross today. Lord God, and we put church as we've known it, even the greatest version of church that we've known, and we put it to death on the cross because we know that you are going to raise it up again in resurrection power. Lord God, that your church will just be full of your fire full of your love, full of your grace, full of your heart. 
Lord God, that it will be equipped and empowered to bring every man and woman to Jesus. Lord God, we bring the church to die. Lord, we don't hate the church. We love your church. We love your church. We love the people in your church. We love the leaders. But we place your church as we know it on the cross. And we say, God, come in resurrection power and raise your church to be the beautiful bride that you've created it to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
Father, we thank you that we're at such a time of shift and change. Things are changing in a moment in front of us, Lord God. And so, Father, we pray, Lord God, that, Lord God, we would be not just hearers of your word, but, Lord, that you would so fill us with your spirit and Activate it on the inside of us so that we go out more filled with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, and with your power. Lord God, not that we would be glorified, but Lord God, that this world would know that there is a wonderful Savior called Jesus who sits enthroned. Father, we pray, fill us with your word today, Lord, whether it comes out my mouth or comes direct from heaven, fill us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, We were privileged, um, Sue Brooke and Ali, uh, and Genev, sorry, and I, the other day, Thursday evening, we went to go and speak with a tiny little group of ladies. And um, we just um, were about to start praying, and there was a lady there, and um, she clearly was very, very poorly. She was as white as a sheet, looked really ill. And um, we hadn't even kind of welcomed Holy Spirit. We hadn't even kind of engaged God, if you know what I mean. Um, ready for the meeting and um, we said let us pray for you and you know immediately the Holy Spirit fell 
Uh, and this lady was just immediately filled with the Holy Spirit and healed, wasn't she? Um, you know, and so before we even started the meeting, you know, we had a testimony of God's wonder and glory and love and grace. And you see, we have a God who is as good as his word. And, you know, we have sometimes just got a bit Christianized, a bit conferenized. You know, we've just got used to going through the motions of church life. And we've forgotten how powerful our God is. Um, we're going to look at Second Chronicles today, which is um, a great area to be looking at in these days, isn't it? But Second Chronicles six, chapter forty, um, it's chapter forty, chapter six, verse forty, um, and it says this: "My God, may your eyes be open." And your ears attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place. Now, arise. If ever there was a time when we need God to arise, it's now. It's now. And God is looking for people who will make themselves available so that he can arise (laughs) You know, he doesn't arise through anything else but his people. And he is looking for people who say, I'm willing. Now arise, Lord God, and come to your resting place. Wow. You and the ark of your might, may your priests, Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your faithful people rejoice in your goodness. And, you know, I was privileged recently to go to Jenny's ordination. Hi, Jenny. And she is the most amazing Anglican person I know. (laughs) She's fabulous. Just stand for a second, Jenny, or just give us a wave. She's awesome. And I want you to look who she is, and I want you to pray for her. I want you to pray for Jenny in the weeks and the months to come because God's hand is upon her and she's got a different spirit, you know? She has a different spirit and she ministers to to all kinds of the most broken people. But, you know, during the service, a lot of people had funny clothes on. Do you know what I mean? They had some real strange outfits and I remember going to Maria's husband Justice's big party I thought we thought we'd gone for a party in Ghana and actually it was the highest church service I think I've ever been to and you see Justice her husband was my friend and Pam will remember us going in Accra and he was my friend he was our friend But what happened was, as I was sitting waiting to speak at the front, they all came down the aisle, all the bishops, and and, and I was getting more and more scared because they all had more big outfits on and, and, and hats and things they were carrying, and it all felt, you know, for me, who's not an Anglican, it just felt a bit like, you know. And finally, beautiful justice came down the final person, all dressed in these beautiful golden robes. And I just burst into tears. And I said, God, he's a real bishop. He's a real archbishop. Because <laughs> he's been my friend. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? And he was a real archbishop in the whole of West Africa. And I love him. We love him to bits. But God is not talking about those robes. You know, he's talking about robes of salvation and righteousness. You know, and I think as God's people, we've forgotten how to wear them. We've forgotten that they're there available for us. And I'm sure when Jenny was being ordained, there was a whole ceremony about how they put the robes on. You know... And they're all on beautiful hangers waiting to be lifted off. But, you know, we have the most beautiful 
beautiful garment of salvation and righteousness. And we don't even take it off the hanger. For all kinds of reasons. But I'm going to go into that today. And it says this. May your faithful people rejoice in your goodness. It doesn't say depending on if you're having a good day. It doesn't say if your circumstances are going well. It doesn't say if you've got money in your bank and you're feeling well. It doesn't say if your husband's been great to you or your wife has looked after you. It doesn't say any of those things. It says faithful people rejoice in his goodness. God is only ever good. I remember Selwyn Hughes and and, uh, we went to stay with Selwyn Hughes some years ago. Mighty, mighty, wonderful man of God. And he said the beginning of sin is when you stop believing that God is good. And that was good. I thought that was good. So I'm not sure we understand what being clothed with salvation really means. Isaiah 61 verse 10 Isaiah tells us this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices. There's that word again. You know, we should be the most joyful people, shouldn't we? Rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me with a robe of righteousness. As Christians, it sounds like something we should be happy about. You know, and look at our faces. Seriously, we need to. Yeah, exactly. We need to actually really look again at God, that he's chosen us, he's appointed us, he's commissioned us, he's anointing you. Why shouldn't we be happy? Why shouldn't we be happy? So what does salvation mean? We think we understand. You know, it means we're saved We are delivered from sin and darkness and hopelessness and chaos and death and so much more. We are being saved every day from a kingdom of this world. Every day when we have our garment of salvation on and our garment of righteousness, we are choosing life over death. You know, we are choosing to not listen to what the enemy wants to draw us into. We've been saved from the kingdom of this world that is ruled by Satan and who desires to lead us every day into temptation and sin. When we repent, now there's a big word. How often as Christians do we say, God have mercy? God, will you forgive me? But we don't say we're sorry. We don't repent and we don't turn away from our wicked ways. But we still want God to be merciful. Um, He is. But I really believe we are at such a crossroads, such a pivotal time in the history of the world Where God is calling us, his people, to a fresh walk of holiness. When we repent and we turn away from our sin, and we really do give our life to Jesus, we are lifted out of the kingdom of darkness, and we are brought into the kingdom of light. It is awesome. And it doesn't just affect us here on earth. We think we, we give our life to Jesus so we've got our ticket stamped so that when we get before the gates of heaven, you know, it goes, looks in the book and it goes, oh yeah, you know, you've got your ticket stamped, you can come in. You know, it starts now. You know, we need to be living in the abundant life of God in the spirit now. You know, and it does, abundance doesn't mean how much you've got in your bank account. It's how much God loves you. And his treasure houses in heaven are just waiting to be opened on your behalf. 
with all kinds of spiritual gifts to equip you and empower you to be the person that God made you to be. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It comes no other way. It does not come through Ouija boards, horoscopes. It doesn't come through any other gods or any other religions. It only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else. Many people have prayed a sinner's prayer. And they go to church, but have not repented and have not chosen to turn away from sin. And I really believe a lot of our churches are totally stumbling along because we are not willing to die to ourselves and to really deal with things so that we can be the people that God created us to be. It leaves people adrift. Because they come to church, they say the sinner's prayer, they don't repent, they don't change. And so they're just like that, you know, brush weed that just is just blown about by the wind, whatever the latest thing is, you know, going here, there and everywhere for an answer when the answer is Jesus. And, you know, God is calling us to a real journey of holiness And we'll get it wrong and we'll be imperfect and we'll make mistakes and we will sin. But we've got to choose immediately to repent and to turn back to God. We cannot be empowered by the Holy Spirit if we are living a life full of sin. You know, we've got to make some good choices Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. You know, God knew what the world was going to be like today. You know, he chose you to live in this time and this season so he can equip you to resist every temptation today. He knows about the internet. He knows about pornography. He knows about all the sexual stuff that's going on. He knows about gambling. He knows about addictions. But he can empower us to make good, healthy choices. Some people think that salvation is just about having a clean slate and being given forgiveness and a second chance. And that is really true. But it is so much more than that. Salvation is not just being saved from something. It's being saved to a fantastic, intimate, loving, lavish, extravagant relationship with the most incredible heavenly father that has ever been and will ever be. It's all about relationship. It's not about religion. People have said to me sometimes, so you're very religious? And I said, "Uh -uh, I'm really not at all. It's all about relationship. And you see, that's what people see. They see being a Christian is about being religious. You know, having a lot of rules. But it's not about that. It's about having a living, powerful relationship with the living God who adores you. It's not hard to have a relationship like that when you understand how much God loves you. Jesus came to die on the cross once and for all. And our life and our garment of salvation was bought with the blood and the life of Jesus. And we need to choose to wear it and walk with integrity and honesty. And we've heard a lot about that in the last few days, haven't we? And I wouldn't say any more than that. Proverbs 10 verse 9, the one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life. But the one who is devious will eventually be exposed. And I want to say to you right now, 
You know, if you're up to anything behind the scenes, deal with it. This is the time where you need to deal with your stuff, whatever that is. Because God is beginning to uncover. He's exposing things. He's bringing things into the light. And so it's much better if you deal with it personally in this time. Proverbs 20 verse 20. Good leadership is built on love and truth. For kindness and integrity, there's that word again, are what keep leaders in their position of trust. It's really simple. We cannot walk in our robes of salvation and righteousness if we're also walking in sin. And I believe that means every day we need to walk in truth, integrity and humility. We can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. We need his Holy Spirit to help us every day. Every day we need to carry our cross. You know, we don't talk about that. It's interesting, um, we did a little prophetic exercise last week or the week before. We had a great time of worshipping Stephen Sue Brooks' home. And um, the Lord had told me to buy this ribbon and it's got little musical notes or keys. Notes or keys on I don't know. One or the other. <laughs> um, and um, I had to attach it to a selection of these little crosses and some keys and the Lord said, put them all in a bag and jumble them all up and ask people to choose. And so they went round the room and I felt God was saying, you know, it's all about him releasing a new sound. Um, you know, there are new musical keys that God is releasing as we go into the heavenly realms. God is releasing new sounds that are going to bring breakthrough and release heaven to earth, you know, through our voices and as we speak and we sing and we play instruments. And so when the bag came back, all the keys had gone, but all the crosses were still here. Interesting. And God is saying, it is time for my people to take up their cross. You know, because that's not a popular word. You know, Jesus took it all upon himself, but he said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. Back to Second Chronicles chapter 6, and it says, Arise, Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Since the death of Jesus, God no longer dwells in an ark or a temple. And we know this. We know it. But actually, when we are sinful, God cannot fill us. He wants you to be his place of habitation. This is the God of the universe. Geneva and I sat on the swing in the garden, didn't we, the other night, Thursday night, and it was a beautiful night, and, and it was just completely clear, and it was completely still and gorgeous, and as it just got darker and darker, you know, we could see the stars all beginning to come out, you know, and it was beautiful, and you just look at the stars and go, gosh, my heavenly father created that. You know, his hands flung those stars into space. And we watched and we saw shooting stars, didn't we? And we saw the space station or something flying over. Um, and it was just absolutely incredible. The God who did all that, that magnificent, enormous, incredible, massive, immeasurably huge, vast God that we haven't got the vocabulary for, the one who did all of that, who created every animal. Go to Chester Zoo and you'll have your mind blown straight away how many animals there are. They're all different. All the zebras have got different patterns. All the giraffes have got different patterns. We've all got different fingerprints. That's God. 
And that awesome God, who's bigger than our vocabulary to describe him, wants to live in you and me. He wants us to be his resting place, his dwelling place, not some ark that's remote. Mighty God has chosen us for such a time as this. He made a way for us to wear those robes of salvation and righteousness bought with that price of his blood. And because of that, not because of our good works, not because of our gifts, our abilities, not because of how many um, you know, degrees we've got, not because we've got theology degrees or we've jumped through a million hoops, but just because he loves us and he chose to die on the cross for us, he's chosen us to carry his presence and to wear his robes of righteousness and salvation. In the story, the priests had got their hearts right and they sacrificed all that needed to be done had been laid out on the altar. Second Chronicles 7 verse 1. And I love this. I love it. This is one of my prayers. God. God, I don't want to go through the motions of church. This is what I live to see. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and it consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. You know, we were in Uganda one year and I don't know those who remember Norma. She used to be part of our team and she was a really tiny. Doreen, where are you, Doreen? Give me a wave. I think... um, Yeah, I think Doreen, you were with us, I think. And we were in this um, tent and we'd had a crazy time and there was a lot of froth and bubble going on in this conference, if you know what I mean. And everyone was very kind of excitable and, and, and God said to me, I want you to bring my presence. And I said to the Lord, how am I gonna do that? Uh, and he said, there's been a lot of froth and bubble. He said, but I want to come. I want you to bring my presence. And I said, Lord, how am I going to do that? He said, I want you to get everyone to be quiet. And I'm like, this is Uganda, God. Yeah. People are never quiet, even in the middle of the night. I bet Nigeria is just the same. Yeah, exactly. And they don't do quiet at all. Not at all at any moment of the day at all or the night. And I'm like, Lord, you know. So I I shared with the other three speakers who were with us. There was three guys. um, Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful men of God. And so um, the first one got up. It was a guy from London. And he got up and he said to everybody, we really believe God wants to come um, and to really meet with us in a really dynamic way and he wants us to be quiet and so no one took any blind notice did the adoring not at all and there was just a lot of you know crazy music and everything was really super loud and they just seemed a bit more excited than they were 10 minutes before so the second speaker got up and um it was a guy called Wes from America and he got up and he said almost the same thing but just slightly different way and he said look we really need to be quiet because we really sense God is going to come when we're quiet and so people began to be quiet but the keyboard players were going you know like very (laughs) you know what I'm talking about eh? like very dramatic playing you know like, we're, you know, we're going to play so dramatically that God's going to come in and it's all going to be really exciting. And I went, no, we don't want the keyboard player either. And then gorgeous Brian Mills got up. Some of you remember Brian Mills, such a gorgeous, gorgeous friend of mine, a real, real father in the Lord. And Brian Mills got up 
And Brian Mills again started to speak and say, you know, we really believe that God wants to come and we need to be quiet. And you need to get off the keyboard, you know, just get off the instruments and just, you know, um, get before the Lord. And so they all began to get ready. And then, of course, people thought that was their moment to start manifesting. (sighs) These guys know what I'm talking about. (laughs) And so you'd have all these people like wailing and screaming and all kinds of, you know, dramatics going on. And so I just thought, you know what? I don't want any of that. I just want God. And so so I got the microphone and I just said to everybody, God wants to come. And he said, if we will be quiet, he will come. So, if you're making a noise, I'm going to command the stewards to come and pick you up and carry you out of this tent because we want God. And all of a sudden, everyone shut up, didn't they? Everyone was silent. And there was a, somebody cutting the grass in the next field and uh, our friend who was hosting the conference ran off to him and gave him some money to shut down the equipment so we could be quiet. And what happened was the glory of God came. And from this left-hand side, the presence of God just began to roll in just roll into this huge tent until it was just full of his glory, full of his presence. You know, sometimes we have to stop doing what we think is the right thing. We need to stop. We need to be still. We need to make room for God um, to come. And that's what happened here. The glory of the Lord filled the temple so much that the priest could not enter. We did pray that there would be so much the glory of God that you wouldn't be able to get into the building. But it hasn't happened yet. We're still praying. Lord. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple. Can you just imagine it, Richard? Can you imagine people driving past on the road? There's no roadworks to hold them up now. Imagine them driving past, you know, and them seeing the fire of God over the building. You know, could you imagine, you know, people prostrating themselves because the holiness of God is so powerful that they cannot drive past. They cannot walk past because the holiness of God is driving them to their knees. You know, the Bible says that one day every knee will bow. And, you know, we the church need to be the first. And we can make excuses why we're not willing to bow the knee. Well, me, me limbs are aching and I can't get back up again. And I know for some of you it's age and it's a bit difficult now. But there's a lot of us who can. We need to bow the knee. We need to bow our hearts before the Lord in real humility. And ask God to search our hearts. Because we come to God like we're perfect. And actually he wants to put his finger on things. Attitudes. When they saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, people knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and they gave thanks, saying, He is good. And his love endures forever. The temple was prepared. The altar was dedicated. The sacrifices were delivered. Then the fire fell. So powerfully the priest couldn't come in. There's an order. And God is wanting to reestablish his order. 
The fire will not come if we, me, you, we, as the church, are not willing to change from being distant religious people to having an intimate relationship with a holy, heavenly Father. You know, people were awestruck. And, you know, people are hungry for a spiritual experience today. You know, you only have to go to some of these fairs where they're queuing up to spend goodness knows how much money for somebody to read their palms or do the tarot cards or whatever. People are hungry. You know, and when we're filled with the Spirit of God, people will be coming to us saying, what is it about you? You know, you can bring hope to someone over the till at Tesco's. You can pray for miracles and see them happen anywhere and everywhere. Our passion and love for God should be clear for all to recognize as they will see the beautiful supernatural garments of salvation and righteousness that we're wearing. You know, it's not about whether you've got your clothes from Next or Marks and Spencers or somewhere like that. People will see the glory of God upon you. They will see Jesus' love. They won't see you as you are. They will see the love of God in you and through you. It then says, Solomon sent the people home. Solomon had done everything he had in mind to do. That's what the Bible says. And then God appeared to him in the middle of the night. And he said, I've heard your prayers. And I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifice. And God wants to say to you today, not the person next to you, but you personally. You know, we can say, oh, well, I, I, can, really, I can really see that's a word for Sue and Dave Van Rassi because they're very holy. And, you know, they've been ministering to the Lord for a long time. I can understand this as a word for them, that they are special, and they're anointed, and they're commissioned. But that's, that's not me. Because you don't really know me. You don't, you don't really know the issues that I've got. But God wants to say he's chosen you. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't even matter your present because your present from today is determined by who, what God says about you. Then God says from 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14, which we hear quoted all the time, but we don't still see a lot of repentance, do we? When I shut up the heavens so there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague amongst my people, if my people who are called by my name, that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, it's our sin first. And then God can heal the land. If ever we need to see our world healed, it's now. You know, I've not given up hope that God can move. I've not given up hope that God can bring a mighty wave of his Holy Spirit that brushes and sweeps nations into the arms of Jesus. If one day every knee is going to bow, it's going to come from a move of the Holy Spirit. And I believe with all my heart, you know, all the years I've been in ministry, I believe stronger now than I've ever done. And the evidence in the church seems worse than it's ever been. And yet God is going to move because he's faithful. He's a faithful God. He's preparing his beautiful bride because the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is coming back. And he's not coming. We, one of our team had a dream of lots of brides all following Jesus. 
you know, he's not coming back for lots of brides. He's coming back for his bride. Beautiful bride. God is calling us as his priests to humble our hearts before him and to pray and seek his face like never before. When we're in that place, we will receive his provision. Our Heavenly Father is able to supply all our needs. CWM, we've been a ministry for 20 years. And we've never had to beg. We've never had to demand. We've never sent a begging letter. You know, we, we, we never make a big deal of it. Very often we don't even remember to take an offering. But God has provided every need that we've ever had. If you need peace today, step closer to Jesus. If you're not in peace, it's because you've stepped away from Jesus. He is our peace. We can trust him. We can trust him. We can trust him with our children. We can trust him with our marriages. We can trust him with our bank accounts. We can trust him with our, what's in our fridge. We can trust him. He's our comforter in the midst of the chaos. He's our hope. He's the one who fights on our behalf. He's faithful. And he's always true. Always, always, always true. When there's so much deception around, you know, come to Jesus. Because he's always true. We need to walk with Emmanuel, God with us. Not just as Christmas, but every second of every day. We need to walk in our garment of salvation and righteousness, secure and full of hope as God's children. Not anxious or fearful, but able to trust our God in the midst of anything that is happening. Then we can pray for our world full, our hearts full of love, mercy and compassion. Then our Heavenly Father will hear from heaven and will forgive and heal our land. I just want to do some prayer and activations now. And I just want you to stand with me. I'm just going to pray. And I just want you to repeat after me these prayers. Father, we repent. We have, where we have walked... With one foot in the world, thinking it's acceptable to walk on the edge of the kingdom of God. Father, we repent where we have drifted away from you and your values of truth and integrity. And as a result, we've, we are living weak and powerless lives. Father, we repent. I just want the Lord to just speak to you right now of anything you need to repent of. And Father, we repent for taking our salvation for granted and for not wearing our garment of salvation and righteousness. Thank you that you came, Lord Jesus, to die on the cross once and for all. Our life and our garment of salvation was bought with the blood and the life of Jesus. Today and every day, we choose to carry our cross. 
knowing that you will be there to help us every step of the way. And I just want you to stand right now if you're standing and just allow the Lord to just place that garment of salvation again upon your shoulders. A garment of righteousness. Just let it rest on your shoulder right now. Feel it like a mantle around your shoulders. Covering every part of you. God needs us and this well needs us right now to carry his presence and to be vessels full of the powerful blessing of God through our prayers and our actions. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, although we will never feel good enough, we thank you that you've chosen us. And we ask you right now to come. For those of you watching at home, we ask Holy Spirit to come right now and to fill you. Some of you were filled with the Holy Spirit a long time ago, but God wants to come and take you to another level. Right now, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit before, you might feel a bit hot. It is a bit hot here anyway. But you might feel hot or you might feel a bit tingly. And that's the Holy Spirit. Just invite him right now. Say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come and fill us. Come and inhabit us, Lord God. The temple was prepared. The altar was dedicated. The sacrifices were delivered. And then the fire fell. Lord, We call forth your fire. Call forth your fire, Lord. Come. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, purifying fire. Reviving fire, reviving fire, come. Blessing, could you come and sing your song? Is that all right? Fire, come. Stay where you are right now. Holy Spirit's here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fresh fire, come. Fresh fire, come. We don't want we, what we had 10 years ago, God. Lord God, we want that fresh fire right now. Lord God. Lord, that's going to turn into a raging inferno. Lord God. Lord God, that's just going to spread, Father. (sighs) Let your fire come, God. Let your fire come, God. (sighs) Let your fire come. Fresh fire, fresh fire. (sighs) That's it, it's here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Touch every man, Lord God. Touch every woman, Lord God. Let your fire come. Let it come, Lord God. Fresh. Mm-hmm. 
spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us Singing again as the spirit was moved over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Oh, come rest up. Oh, on you to come as the spirit is moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest.
move over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest us. Yeah, come rest us. Sing it again. As the Spirit must move over the water. Spirit, come move over us. today and you might never have given your life to Jesus and we want to give you opportunity today you might be watching this you know at home and you might never have given your life to Jesus and I just want to say to you today don't wait another moment our wonderful Jesus left heaven he left to father's side and he came to this sinful world and he lived on this earth and when he was 33 years old he went to the cross he was nailed brutally to a cross he wasn't just physically nailed to a cross but while he was on that cross he took upon himself every sickness every disease every sin that had ever been committed from Adam and Eve until he comes again so that he could make a way for you and I to live and have a relationship with our Heavenly Father we want to give you that opportunity today. Don't wait another moment. I'm just going to pray a prayer. And I just want you to pray this with me, whether you're at home or whether you're here today. Father God, I repent and I turn away from my sin. I thank you that you paid the price that I can be free. Father, I receive today that garment of salvation and righteousness. And I pray for you right now that you would straight away encounter the love of your heavenly Father. That you will be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Come rest, Lord God, upon your people afresh. In Jesus' name. If you've given your life to Jesus today or in the days ahead, if you watch this, please do let us know and we'll be praying for you.
for those at home, just get your bread and your juice or your wine as we come together to share communion. One of my favourite songs in the recent weeks is a song, I Speak Jesus. The lyrics start, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. There's so many voices, so much deception, so many lies, a lack of integrity and honesty and truth. But it's time. It's time that the voice of truth that is Jesus is spoken out over every situation, over every person, over our families, over our neighbourhood, over our towns, over our cities, over our region, over our nation and across the world. As we come to share communion today, we are remembering just why the name of Jesus is so powerful. We are remembering just what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, the mediator of the new agreement between God and man. You see, the problem with the old covenant wasn't God or his laws, but it was us, his people. Hebrews 8, 7 to 8. We could never keep the laws, but we were too sinful and rebellious. But Jesus, the perfect, spotless, unblemished Lamb of God, shed his own blood to ratify this better covenant based on better promises. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Our filthy rags of sin were exchanged for robes of righteousness. And we've been hearing about this. Garments of salvation and righteousness. He paid the price for us. He redeemed us. He bought us back with his life. For the wages of sin is death. See, Jesus paid the price. He gave his life to satisfy the Father's wrath by taking the place of sinful man, that's us, on the altar of the cross. The new covenant redeemed mankind from the curse of the law. Hebrews 2 verse 11, Ephesians 2 verse 6, Jesus became the curse. And I want to remind you about Jesus' blood. You see, Jesus' blood speaks of better things. And my, don't we need better things? As I share what the, I felt the Holy Spirit wanted me to share, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is the blood, Jesus' blood, speaking to you today? Number one, the blood shed through the stripes laid on his back speaks of our healing from sickness and disease. Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5, 1 Peter 2, verse 24. By his stripes, we are healed. Have any of you 
got sickness in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, bring them to the Lord. The blood that trickled from the nails in his hands and the sword that pierced his side speaks of our complete redemption. We have been redeemed. We have been bought, bought at a price. We've been saved from our sin. We now, when we stand before the holy Lord God Almighty on judgment day, we will be found not guilty. Amen. We have eternal life. Death has lost its sting. Amen. There is no place for death to surround us anymore. There's no place for death to hold us anymore. For we have a life through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood cries out, we are made his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Philippians 3 verse 9. We are right before the Lord. And we can enter, enter boldly into the throne room. There's now no distance between us and the Father. As in the days of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they could walk and talk with him, we too can walk and talk with him. How close is your relationship with our Abba Father? The blood calls us to purge our consciences of sin, not with the perishable blood of bulls and of goats that left a remembrance of sins every year, but with the precious and eternal blood of the spotless Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, verses 19 to 20. Revelation 13, verse 8. Is there any sin within us that we need to cleanse? We need the Lord to cleanse by his blood. As we share communion, ask the Holy Spirit. The blood speaks to the believer that he is forever sanctified. He's made clean, set apart, consecrated through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10 verse 10. Are we different from the world? Do we stand out? The blood calls the believer to come up to a higher awareness of his or her rightful position at the very throne of God to begin praying from a position of authority in him that is above every circumstance of the world. Are we allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed by circumstances and paralyzed by the troubles of the world? We are more than overcomers through the blood of Jesus. The blood declares qualification and consecration of the believer as a son, as a daughter of Almighty God. Do you know? Do I know who we are in Christ? Our identity in Him. And finally, the blood proclaims believers to be co laborers in the earth, ambassadors sent forth to powerfully tell the good news from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around, that Jesus saves, Jesus heals, and Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Do we share the gospel, the good news with those we meet? And so, as Paul spoke in 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I invite you, whether you're here or at home, to take and to eat this bread in the remembrance of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And to take this cup of wine or juice and allow his blood shed for us to speak to us in a new and powerful way today. Amen. So come and share and take. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus.